recent uh, survey for our audio tape uh, series. Uh, one of the most popular figures that uh, our subscribers wanted to hear from was Mike. So uh, we did the deal and we got Mike on the phone. And uh, Mike, let me uh, just take a minute and have you introduce yourself. A lot of people know who you are and your background in bodybuilding. But for some of the people who uh, might be new to the sport, they uh, they might not know. Could you uh, just shed a little bit of light on your background in bodybuilding and uh, where you come from? All right. I come from a small town in Pennsylvania, Effort of Pennsylvania. I started my training career almost exactly 30 years ago at the age of 11. I can remember very, very clearly. I was at a local newsstand with my mother, and while she was off shopping, uh, I was looking over a vast array of magazines, and after a period of time, my attention became arrested by the sight of a bodybuilder, of course, on a muscle magazine cover. I grabbed it, and there was an instantaneous love affair started. I've been doing it ever since, actually off and on. Uh, I started competing. At the age of 18 in local physique contest, which I did very well in, I won my first contest, which was the Mr. Lancaster County, Pennsylvania contest. Not long thereafter, I went to the state level and won the Mr. Pennsylvania. Not long after that, I went to the Mr. America, the AAU Mr. America in 1971 and placed 10th in that behind Casey Vieter and others. Casey was first that year. Um, not too long after that, I injured my right shoulder quite severely while training and was forced to lay off for several years. In late 1974, I started back training. Uh, I should say resume training. <laughs> and went into competition again in 1975, at which time I entered the IFBB Mr. America in Los Angeles, where I placed third behind Robbie Robinson and Roger Callard. That motivated me quite a bit, and the next year I trained very, very hard, came back to win that contest in 1976, IFBB Mr. America. In 1978, I won the IFBB Mr. Universe, or World Championships, as they're now called, with the first and only perfect score in history. Wow. In 1979, I won my first pro contest, the Southern Pro Cup in Florida. Did well in several other professional contests, then won my weight class at the Mr. Olympia in 1979, placed second to Frank Zane overall. So they used to have uh, they used to have weight classes in the uh, in the Olympia, right? Uh, under 200, over 200, or yeah. Uh -huh. And you won the over 200 uh, weight class yeah, in the Mr. I won the over 200 with a perfect score. Wow, a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, uh, an interesting bit of history. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next year, in 1980, I placed fifth at the Mr. Olympia, a contest that I and almost everyone else who witnessed it was convinced was fixed. Mm -hmm. And as a result, decided to drop out of competitive bodybuilding. Really? Now, that was the year that Arnold won it back in Columbus. Was no, that? That was in Sydney, Australia in 1980. Oh, okay. But, uh, and it, that was Arnold's comeback year. Right. Okay. Huh. And you got you were so frustrated by that, you just stepped out of competitive bodybuilding. Well, frustrated in that I came to see quite clearly that there was corruption involved, that uh, evil was not something you merely read about in newspapers and novels, that it's all around us. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I had a glimmering of certain facts that led me to believe there might be something like this going on, but it, I wasn't so certain. This brought it all into focus, and I didn't want to be involved or associated with people like that and decided to drop out. Wow. What about, uh, what have you been doing since then? I know you've stayed close to the sport, though. Right. Um, in 1983, I left Los Angeles, where I worked for Joe Weider and his Muscle and Fitness magazine, to go to Florida to work for Arthur Jones at Nautilus. Okay. I 
stayed there for a relatively short period, only six months, uh, which is quite interesting, actually. A year or two prior to that, I said to an old friend of mine, I wouldn't mind working for Arthur Jones, if only for six months, to get to see how his mine works. As it turned out, it was only six months, and I left his employ, went to Europe, performed numerous exhibitions and seminars, mm -hmm. came back for a short period, actually a year and a half, I published and served as editor of my own magazine, Workout for Fitness, which was a more general fitness magazine, soft core bodybuilding magazine, as I called it. Right. That went under, and I went back to work for Weeder as a writer. And then four years ago, in addition to still writing for Joe Weeder, I started my own personal training business, which started out quite slowly. I bring that up for those listeners who might be considering starting their own training business or who are having trouble now. I was quite surprised that it did start out very slow. I thought that with my visibility and name recognition, I'd move into that business and it would be a spectacular success right from the outset, but it was not. Mm -hmm. In the first four or five months, I only had a few clients. and was on the verge of giving up when all of a sudden it just started paying off for whatever reason, it started to flourish. And I've been quite happy with it now. Four years later, it's better still in part as a result of my continuing my articles in Flex and Muscle and Fitness and also as a result of several top bodybuilders finally recognizing that heavy duty, high intensity training not only works in theory, or is not only true in theory, but that it works in practice. People like Aaron Baker, David Durth, David Paul, Lee Labrada, and last but not least, the most gracious and the greatest of all, Dorian Yates. I say gracious because prior to winning his first Mr. Olympia last year and since, he's been very kind to give me a good deal of credit. I found out just recently that after this last Mr. Olympia at the breakfast seminar the next day, he talked quite a bit about me. Apparently, he was motivated to start training by, as a result of having seen my photographs, hmm. having read my articles, bought and read my books. Not only was he inspired by the image of my physique, but he was brighter than the average bodybuilder. He, as a result of having read my books and articles, he came to understand the theory of high-intensity training. Mm -hmm. recognized its validity, used it, and went on to win European British Championships, uh, Knight of Champions, and now the 1992 and 93 Mr. Olympias. Right. So yeah. many, many people who may have been wary, skeptical, even openly hostile to the theory of high-intensity training are now not so much so. They're saying, geez, maybe Mincer was right, or at least he he was on to something. If it worked for Dorian Yates and he and Casey Vieter and Ray Mincer, there has to be something to it. Right. Well, we're going to, I want to talk in detail about that. I have a couple of questions um, that, that come to mind. And first of all, I'd like to second your comment on Dorian Yates. Uh, he is a really bright, Bodybuilder. Uh -huh. the, the guy is very articulate, and he's uh, he's really a gentleman. Um, very much so. I uh, met him uh, just last week uh, down at Club Metrax, Dr. Uh -huh. Conley's gym down there, where uh, Chris Lund was shooting some photos. And he is a really, really a neat guy. And uh -huh. I've been around a lot of bodybuilders, just like you have. And uh, guys like him are, are pretty rare. So yeah, I was just going to say that uh, Bill, he is quite rare. Not only is he bright, brighter than the average bodybuilder. He's got a great attitude. He's benevolent. He's amiable. He's open and accessible to fans. He doesn't have this attitude that he's superior by virtue of having bigger muscles than anybody else. Right. He's a human being. 
Yeah, I agree all the way. Now you said you talked about the corruption in bodybuilding that that really soured you on the competitive aspects of the sports, um, and then you said that you worked for Weeder for a few years. Are you saying that the corruption in bodybuilding is is with uh, IFBB organizations and not necessarily the Weeder camp or the judging no, or? I worked for Joe Weeder and still do as a writer for Flex and Muscle and Fitness. Uh, now they do obviously have some association with the IFBB, but I, I'm not involved in that. I'm no longer a staff writer, I act as a freelancer. So I'm not, in, I'm not associated with that element. I mm-hmm. keep my distance from those people. Uh, I even rarely talk to Joe these days. Most of my conversations or my associations with that camp is with the editors. Right. Jerry Candela, John Little, Peter McGuff. Right. Um, but I mean, where is the, where was the corruption that, that you saw? I mean, is that in, like I said, the judging? Is that in the promotional side of it? Or is that in the, you know, just the core of the IFBB or, or um... Well, it has to do with the type of mentality that Ben Weider has brought into the IFBB. Mm-hmm. I remember many years ago I heard stories and I came to know as a fact that several of the top IFBB administrators, judges, had criminal backgrounds. I thought that was quite interesting. Um, hmm. And I realized later maybe it's not just a coincidence. Hmm. I don't know, uh, but it was a fact. It is a fact. Huh. Well, that uh, you know, it's uh, it's the only game in town, and and uh, you know they pretty much have their say so in how they run it. So I guess well, that's, I, I still uh, see problems, Bill. But of course, my my experience was back then in 1980. Right. I saw that. Arnold was the IFBB if he wanted to be, and that particular day in Sydney, Australia, the day of the Olympia, he was the IFBB. Mm -hmm. I had been given to believe prior to that that Ben Weir was the president of the IFBB, and beyond that, he prided himself on being a stern, strong president. But on that particular day in 1980, he took a distant back seat to Arnold. Arnold seemed to be running things. He could have it any way he wanted. Well, Only once I stood up at the pre-judging meeting did, did that thing come to at least a partial halt. That irritated Ben Weider. He stood in between Arnold and I and tried to assert himself, but it became very clear, especially later on as the day proceeded, that things weren't the way they should be. Hmm. Very, very clear. If it was just me saying this, of course it could be chalked up to sour grapes, although that's not true. I've lost contests before. I never raised a fuss. But that particular contest was so clearly fixed that every other competitor and many of the fans in the audience raised a fuss. And, of course, the in the aftermath, all the magazines carried articles pertaining to the fact that it was fixed, it was very clear. Hmm. What makes it even more interesting, the very next year it happened again with Franco. this time Arnold running the contest. Either he's running it or he's winning it or his friends are winning it. The next year Franco Colombo won with a condition known as gynecomastia where his the breast tissue or his chest takes on the look of having breast tissue. His right leg was maimed in an accident a couple of years before, and that looked deformed. Mm-hmm. And he went on to beat people like Tom Plath, who was in the best shape of his life, right. and quite a few other people. It was a clear indication that Arnold Schwarzenegger and the IFBB were above ethical principles. They were literally snubbing their nose at 
the collective bodybuilding community. We run this thing and we'll do it any way we want. We did it last year and we're going to do it this year. We <laughs> could care less. We're above principles. Well, they can have it. They can have their contest, their Mr. Olympia, whatever it is. I couldn't care less. I actually enjoy my position where I'm at now a lot better. Okay, so what would you say, because, because a lot of people who follow this, this sport and get into weightlifting, you know, are kind of pressured into taking that competitive route because uh, a lot of the information providers and the magazines and, and even my magazine to some extent is guilty of, uh, you know, possibly portraying professional bodybuilders in a little bit uh, too much of a, uh, a special light. Yeah. They, uh, uh, you know, they, they may not have, you know, the, the greatest lives and it may not be the greatest role models for people, but what is your feeling now just in general on competitive bodybuilding, having been through all that you have? Would you recommend it to people who are getting into the uh, weightlifting or? No, no, I would not recommend it, Bill. And I don't limit this accusation. I don't level it only against the IFBB. I see it in all organizations on every level from the most limited local to the regional, to the state, to the national, the international, the amateur, and the professional. Everybody knows it. Everybody involved in the sport, including you, Joe Weider, Frank Zane, all the NAVA people, all the IFBB people know this. And nobody's willing to talk about it. Not a single one of them. They're all a bunch of namby-pamby crybabies who see all this immorality going on. They live their lives as a giant pretense, pretending this stuff is not happening. John Balick knows it over at Iron Man. Bob Kennedy knows it. They all talk about it at their cocktail parties before and after the contest, or it's implied. Contests are fixed. NPC contests, IFBB contests. And I get sick and tired of hearing people bring up the idea that, well, bodybuilding is subjective. So who are you to say that contests are fixed? That is not true. Anything that exists in reality can be viewed, judged objectively. There are objective criteria for judging bodybuilders. It's interesting, at the 1980 Olympia, the only people who saw Arnold as the winner were the seven judges and his closest friends. Mm-hmm. None of the other competitors saw him as the winner. None of the audience, or very few, only those that were his friends. When Dorian Yates won the Mr. Olympia a couple weeks ago in Atlanta, Georgia, everybody, all of the audience, all of the judges, all of the competitors, without a single exception, except for this guy named Greg Zulak, who has a bug up his butt about Mike Metzer and his mustache, <laughs> saw that Dorian Yates was the winner. If it was subjective, why didn't somebody say uh, the guy who placed last was the winner? There are objective criteria without a doubt. Bodybuilding is not subjective. When it's very, very close, you might, <clears throat> of course, haggle over one guy having a little bit more size versus the other guy having a little bit more definition, but those are still objective criteria. There is no way that Arnold Schwarzenegger deserved to win in 1980, not even close. <laughs> well, so you would basically say that, uh, you know, the competitive route is, 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 is not the best way to go. No. And so what is it that people get into weight training for? Because you work with people one-on-one. You know uh, what's going on. What do you recommend to them? Just to get what they can out of the well, activity? Well, here's what I usually say. This is a wonderful endeavor in and of itself. There's a lot of self-satisfaction to be derived from recognizing that you were able to discipline yourself and use a certain amount of knowledge to take yourself from point A to point C, take your body from being average or below average to whatever it ultimately might be. If you want to compete, then just be be warned beforehand. There's a lot of politics, and by politics I mean corruption, without a doubt. 
If you recognize that and you still want to do it, you've got my best wishes. But don't let me just don't let me hear you complain later on. Right. If you know it beforehand and you decide or agree to go ahead with it, then you have no reason to complain. Right. Now, um, <clears throat> then the people that you work with, basically, you encourage them to just really uh, get what they can out of building their bodies and, and learn to use that to enhance their self-esteem and discipline and and all of these things that are positive about the activity. Yeah. Um, something I tell my phone consultation clients especially, I know that you want these muscles. That's true, it's valid, it's good, nothing wrong with that. But if you were to look deep down inside of yourself, get honest, what you're really looking for, even a businessman, somebody who wants to make a lot of money, a million dollars, they do want the money and that's fine and good. At bottom, the purpose of all goal achievement is to develop a sense of mastery, efficacy, to achieve a certain type of happiness that can only be had as a result of achieving goals. A lot of people find once they acquire the muscles they'd always dreamed of, they're not really different inside. Because they, they don't take this philosophical approach as you started this particular issue with. And I just concluded it with. Hmm. The idea is to gain a sense of mastery, a sense of self-esteem, happiness, which can only be derived from achieving goals. Huh. Yeah, that's a... That's a... But you have to have that stated explicitly at the outset. If you think that you're going to end up having those things only as a result of having the muscles, and you don't work on developing other aspects of your life along with it, like your philosophy, then you're just going to end up with a set of muscles and be bereft of the rest. Right. You and I both know, Bill, a lot of top bodybuilders. As top bodybuilders, of course, they have the big muscles, but they're self-arrested intellectually. They're right. no further ahead at the age of 30 or 40 mentally than they were 10 or 15 years ago when they started. They're psychologically beset by the same conflicts, the same sense of insecurity, uncertainty, self-doubt. They've got the big muscles, but they didn't get that sense of mastery, self-esteem, which can only be achieved by starting the whole process by stating explicitly, not only do I want big muscles, but I want self-confidence. I can only get that by enjoying the process, gaining the knowledge, recognizing that I am a more effective person. That's, yeah, that's great. I know that one of the, the most popular questions that we get um, here is about, you know, training. And a lot of people say, uh, I tried Mike Menser's system, and I can't believe the difference that it made. Uh -huh. And so what is it that, that is different about your weight training philosophy, uh, the actual hands-on stuff in the gym? And, and maybe go back and trace, is this something that you've used all of your career, or did you try all different styles and then finally discover this? I, like most bodybuilders, tried a variety of things. I, like most bodybuilders, approached the subject... I'm sorry, let me back up a second. I, like the vast majority of bodybuilders, Bill, made the mistake of approaching the subject of training on the implicit assumption that all training theories had some merit. Then I wasted precious, precious time frantically trying one after the other in the hope that someday, somehow, some way I find something that works. I see bodybuilders doing it today, and again I say it's a mistake. Bill, it could not possibly be true that all, or even many, or even two training theories had equal merit or were, were of equal validity. There is and can be only one valid scientific theory of anything. For example, there's only one valid science of mathematics, medicine, astronomy, ethics, electronics. Likewise, there is and can be only one valid 
scientific theory of exercise. And it just so happens to be, as I learned 20 years ago, the theory of high intensity training. Prior to that time, I was training up to three hours a day, six days a week, making little or no meaningful progress. I had finally reached a point where I was about to forsake my bodybuilding goals. I couldn't justify spending four hours a day in the gym. I was already working 12 hours a day in the Air Force, working a part-time job, trying to see my girlfriend as much as I could. I just couldn't justify spending one more hour a day in the gym. At that time, I was fortunate to make the acquaintance of Arthur Jones, who during a lengthy phone conversation explained to me in the most scrupulously objective language imaginable the theory of high intensity training. I recognized almost immediately that it was true, that I was not the expert on the subject I had thought I was. In fact, I came to realize I knew almost literally nothing of value about the subject of exercise. Muscle magazines, I came to understand, are not sacred scripture. They're not even science journals. And even if they were, you've got to read science journals critically, too. Exactly. Muscle magazines take articles from almost anybody. As a result, a lot of the information is contradictory. This is why most bodybuilders are agonizingly confused, painfully bewildered. Well, one month they tell us this in one magazine, the next month in the same magazine, or even the same month in a different article, they tell us something different. By the way, the, the first chapter of my new revised heavy duty book is entitled Bodybuilders Are Confused. Every day of the year, Bill, seven days a week, I get phone calls from bodybuilders all over the world. The most, their most salient characteristic is what I just described. They're confused, agonizingly slow, agonizingly so. The muscle magazines, for instance, tell people that all bodybuilders are different. They all re that we all require different training programs. Then they go on to contradict themselves by suggesting everybody do 12 to 20 sets. Well, I thought we're all different. If we're all different, then why in the hell is everybody doing the same damn thing? Mm -hmm. In fact, it is true, of course, we're all different in that each of us has a unique personality. More important in this context, anatomically and physiologically, we're all essentially the same, which is what makes it possible for me to state with such certainty that there is and can be only one valid scientific theory of training. When a person goes to medical school to study that particular science, medicine, they study the basic principles of physiology, which are universal. They apply to everybody. If everyone's cells, muscles, and organs were constituted and functioned differently, we'd all be unique physiological entities unto ourselves. And doctors couldn't make diagnoses, perform surgeries, or dispense medicines. It's this fact, the fact that we're all essentially the same anatomically and physiologically that makes it possible for medical science to exist at all as a viable discipline. Now, the science of exercise, the science of productive bodybuilding exercise, like the science of medicine, is based on the principles of human physiology also. The fact that the basic principles of human physiology are universal, again, is what makes it possible for me to state that there is only one valid theory of training, i.e., one best way to train. It is not my mere opinion that every human being requires intense training to stimulate optimal increases in strength and size. It's a well-established fact beyond debate. Nobody would argue that aerobics is the best way to build muscle. They may not understand it explicitly, but they recognize or sense on some level that the reason for this is that aerobics is too low in intensity. To 
stimulate an optimal increase in strength and size, or, or any increase in strength or size. It is a well-established fact beyond debate that high-intensity training is an absolute requirement for stimulating increases in strength and size. That's the first principle of the theory of high-intensity training. And because high-intensity training is very, very demanding on the body's limited recovery ability, it follows logically that such training must be brief and infrequent to allow for the production of an increase in strength and size. That's the second part of the theory. In order to allow the body to produce the increase that was stimulated as a result of the training, the workouts have to be brief and infrequent. In other words, bodybuilding is not aerobics. This is the hard part. This is the hard part for most people. Most bodybuilders would find it quite easy to accept the first principle that you've got to train to failure, that the training has to be very intense. The hard part is in accepting the second two principles, namely that exercise has to be brief and infrequent. They all have in their subconscious the idea that more is better, which is actually an, an ethical economic principle. More money, more pretty girls, more success, i.e. more values are better than less. You can't take a principle from economics or ethics and apply it to bodybuilding and expect optimal results. That's a logical fallacy known as context switching, taking a principle from one context of knowledge and applying it to another and expecting to get something out of it. Bodybuilding is not aerobics. If your goal is to improve upon your endurance, which is what aerobics is about, then it's appropriate to use the more is better principle because that's your goal, to be able to do more and more work. Bodybuilding requires the application of a different principle, namely harder is better. And the harder you train, the less time you can or should train. One of my favorite analogies here is with track and field. Bill, are you not familiar with the fact that sprinters always have larger, more muscular thighs and calves than distance runners? Absolutely. Well, if it was the sheer volume of the work that was responsible for inducing muscular growth beyond normal levels in human beings, then distance runners would have tremendously large thighs and calves, when in fact, in every case, they have stringy muscles. They're, they grossly overtrain. Right. Sprinters, the guys who only run 100 to 400 meters very intensely, have tremendously developed legs. They run very, very hard. This prevents them from running for long distances. The longest sprint in Olympic competition is the 400-meter dash. Why isn't there a mile dash? Because no one can run that intensely that long. Likewise with bodybuilding training. When, you're tr when you are training to failure on every set, and you're not resting too long between sets, it's not just that you shouldn't train for long periods, but you literally cannot. No one can. It's in the nature of things. Hmm. Wow, that is this is great stuff. So you you've determined, and this is some of the stuff you've learned from Arthur Jones. Is where did, in this initial? I learned some of this from Arthur Jones, but I've developed it recently. Hmm. Well, it's an interesting thing that you brought up, Arthur Jones. <clears throat> Arthur Jones advanced this theory 20 years ago, namely that to be productive, exercise has to be intense, brief and infrequent. Those are the three principles of the theory. He was right. I recognized it immediately. While he was explaining it to me, I reflected on my own experience. I connected those ideas with other knowledge I already had. I saw logically, in reason, why this was true. But Arthur Jones was missing one bit of crucial knowledge. Let me explain. When he first advanced that theory 20 years ago, he suggested that everybody train the full body three days a week with 12 to 15 sets of workout. Now, compared to everything else being espoused at the time, all other training theories, that certainly did seem brief and infrequent. But here was the one bit of crucial knowledge he was missing. 
there exists a wide range of variation among individuals with regard to exercise tolerance. Don't you know certain people, Bill, who don't tolerate exposure to high-intensity ultraviolet sunlight as well as others? Exactly. Right? Yeah. That's a genetic trait. Follow me here. All genetic traits are expressed across a broad continuum. The most directly perceivable genetic trait is height. With regard to height, you've got midgets at one extreme and the giants of the NBA at the other. That's a wide range of expression of a genetic trait, from midget to giant. With intelligence, you've got morons at the far left end and geniuses at the far right and everything in between. Then again, with individual sunlight tolerance, you've got albino Scandinavians at the left end and darker skin types like Negroes at the right who can tolerate long periods of frequent exposure to high intensity sunlight. I have the evidence, but don't you think it stands to reason that that same thing would apply to individual exercise tolerance? Exactly. I have some clients, Bill, who are only doing three sets every seven days. Until I got them down to that, they were making no progress. That was the one bit of crucial knowledge that Arthur Jones was missing 20 years ago. Again, he suggested everybody train the full body. 12 to 15 sets three days a week, which again, compared to everything else, that certainly did seem brief and infrequent. But there does exist this wide range of variation, this broad continuum of expression of that genetic trait, individual exercise tolerance. Some people are morons of recovery ability, as I jokingly refer to one of my smart ass clients. <laughs> Just jokingly. So, so how would you determine a person's recovery ability? Is All right, very good question. This one particular young man came to me two years ago as a result of having read my books and articles. He came to understand the theory of high-intensity training. He recognized its validity. He came to me, therefore, wildly enthusiastic, fully expecting to, to achieve the greatest progress of his life. When he came to me, I put him on a standard training protocol of seven sets per workout, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. After three months, he was making almost no progress. Now remember, he came to me wildly enthusiastic. After three months of no progress, he became dispirited, disheartened. He was ready to give up. Now, two years ago, I hadn't been training people all that long myself, so this was kind of a new experience. I was a little bit confused, too. I gave it some thought one day and sat him down, and I said, Now, look, let's not regard this thing merely as a physical adventure, but an intellectual one as well. Let's go to the theory that you and I both recognize as the one and only possible valid theory of productive bodybuilding exercise, the theory of high-intensity training. Let's go to the first principle, the principle of intensity. By the way, if, if a, a given bodybuilder's current training program is not yielding him continuous progress, or hasn't been for some time, it's not going to magically start working next week. There's a reason for everything, including lack of progress, and the number of possible explanations is not infinite. You'll find the answer in what I'm about to say. You go to the first principle of the one and only valid theory, the principle of intensity. This young man and I both recognized and agreed that he was not faking the intensity bill. He was carrying each set to failure. Therefore, he was doing everything a human being could possibly do to stimulate an increase in strength and size. We were left to conclude that the increase was not being produced I'm making a distinction here between growth stimulation and growth production. You don't actually grow during the workout. The workout merely serves as a stimulus. It sets the growth process into motion. The body produces the growth during the rest period. It only stands to reason if the rest period is not sufficient. That is, if you're doing any more sets per workout, or any more workouts in a given unit of time that are minimally required to stimulate the optimal increase, to that extent you're overtraining, and to that extent you'll be hampering and possibly be preventing the production of the increase.
so that's what we concluded. We concluded that while he was stimulating the increase, his body was not able to produce it because he was overtraining. So to remedy the situation, I cut his workout back from seven sets to only five. And I reduced the frequency from every other day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, to every third day. So now he was training Monday, taking Tuesday and Wednesday off, training Thursday, taking Friday and Saturday off, training Sunday. Then, of course, the next week he would not work out Monday. He would take Monday and Tuesday off, train Wednesday, every 72 hours. Hmm. What happened? He remained stagnant. He even regressed a little bit. This really surprised me. Up to that time, I had never encountered such a a client, one who was unable to make any progress. This is when I started giving some considerable thought to what I knew about genetics, how genetic traits are expressed across a broad continuum. If you've got midgets and giants with regard to height, again, a broad continuum of expression, a very broad continuum. If you've got morons and geniuses and intelligence, Scandinavians and Negroes with regard to exercise tolerance, I'm sorry, sunlight tolerance, well, then it only stood to reason that the same thing would apply to individual exercise tolerance. This young man was a midget of recovery ability. So, to further remedy the situation, I cut his workouts back even further in terms of volume from five sets to only three, and the frequency from every third day to every fifth day, and guess what happened, Bill? He started making progress. Now, what do most bodybuilders do? <clears throat> they, they run to their local newsstand, pick up a bunch of magazines, muscle magazines. They run home, mindlessly page through the, those magazines. In essence, that, well, that's what it turns out to be. And that's not a put down. Most young people are not taught how to critically analyze written material, right. which is not necessarily their fault. They mindlessly thumb through muscle magazines and at random grab a given training program, then go to the gym and slavishly adhere to it for as long as two years, during which time they make little or no meaningful progress and conclude erroneously in many cases that they have terrible genetics, that they're hard gainers or no gainers, then they, they lose their fire, their motivation. They no longer aspire to develop to the upper limits of their potential, and their training degenerates into a social ritual. Right. This so, young man started out training seven sets per workout every other day. It wasn't until I got him down to three sets every five days or so that he started making progress. There's a lot more to the science of modern bodybuilding than what I just described as being the typical pattern of most bodybuilders. Most bodybuilders make the mistake, once again, of regarding what's written in muscle magazines as sacred scripture. They accept it uncritically. They have the notion that if something is printed, it has to be true. I know because I had that attitude myself 20 years ago. But I was fortunate to have made the acquaintance of a very intelligent man, Arthur Jones, he told me 20 years ago, Mike Menser, 95% of what is published on all subjects is hogwash. Now, 20 years later, a whole lot of experience, a lot of studying in the areas of philosophy, logic, and science, I understand that Mr. Jones was being charitable, Bill. In fact, 98% of what is published on all subjects is hogwash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Arthur Jones is a... Is a He's a real genius. He is a, Arthur Jones is still one of the, the greatest geniuses ever to contribute to. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Weight training. When you I talk, I can't to, give him enough credit. Yeah, I I think I think a lot of the younger people or people that are newer to the sport have no idea what his contribution actually uh, amounts to. Um, when you mentioned uh, specifically that the the client you were working with was doing three sets, right? Is that three sets per body part or three sets? Three set total for everything. What's a, what would it be an example of that, to break it down a little more specifically? He would do a set of squats for his lower body, mm -hmm. a set of pull-downs, close grip underhand pull-downs for his back, 
and biceps. Mm -hmm. And a set of heavy incline presses or dips for his chest, shoulders, and triceps. And that was his workout. There's way too much overlapping today. That's one of the reasons for all the overtraining. You've got guys who will do four sets of flat benches for their pecs, four sets of inclines, four sets of declines, all of which work the triceps and shoulders. Then they do four sets of standing presses for their shoulders right afterwards, along with eight other sets of shoulder work. Then they go do four sets of tricep press downs and four sets of dips and something else. They, they end up doing 36 sets for body part. Jesus. <clears throat> Most bodybuilders, and this is a very important subject for those listening, if there's one thing that I could get across to you as being most crucially important during the course of this interview to you as bodybuilders, it's this. Most bodybuilders are only dimly aware, Bill. They only sense vaguely that overtraining means something kind of, sort of negative. You hear bodybuilders use the term quite frequently, but none of them really know precisely what it means. They've never given it a definition, therefore it plays no central role in their thinking or in guiding their training efforts. The term overtraining is very, very important. The phenomenon of overtraining is very important. It's more than something just kind of, sort of negative. It is the worst training mistake you could possibly make. It is that which militates against your achieving the desired result. What is overtraining? It's overtraining, people. It means performing any more exercise than is required, even one set more than is required, to stimulate an optimal increase in strength or size. Even one set more than is required is overtraining. Wow, this bad looks, for you. Yeah, this looks like a... Uh, I mean, this is something that, uh, even though you've been around, most people still are, are not uh, even aware they're of. They're not getting uh, this. No, they're not getting it. I'll tell you what, Mike, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, Mike had some pretty passionate thoughts about uh, what a mistake this is. Mike, do you want to pick up there? Yeah, just, just to reiterate, overtraining is a lot worse than just something kind of, sort of negative. It's the worst training mistake you can make, and it means performing any more exercise than is required to stimulate an optimal increase in strength or size. Even one set beyond that which is required is, is bad for you, is a negative, and as bad as that is, two extra sets is more than twice as bad. And of course then three extra sets is more than three times as bad. One of my favorite analogies here is within getting a suntan. You'll get a suntan every time you go out into the intense August sun, so long as you don't overexpose yourself. What happens, Bill, when you expose your skin to even one minute more high-intensity ultraviolet sunlight in August than is required to get a suntan? You burn. You burn. What do you think might happen if you were to perform even one set more high-intensity exercise than is required to stimulate an increase in strength and size? You would overtrain. Overtraining is the equivalent of getting a sunburn. You have to understand that man, the human being, is a specific entity with specific characteristics and specific requirements, including specific training requirements. Science itself is an exact specific discipline. A proper science of bodybuilding should tell the individual exactly, specifically what to do. What do the muscle magazines suggest most frequently? Everybody do 12 to 20 sets. That's not very exact. Is it 12 or is it 20? And if it's 12, who in the hell wants to do 20? Is it ever nine? Is it ever 14? I'm telling the listeners that theoretically and in practice, I have found that one set per exercise and no more than two sets per muscle is all that's required. Any more than that is overtraining. Hmm. To the extent that you overtrain, you will hamper and possibly prevent the production of the increase that the workout stimulated. 
enough on that. Okay, so let's talk about this specifically, because this is something that is totally opposite of what most people have been led to believe for a long time. Well, you're, you're telling me that if I go to the gym and I do one set of squats, my legs are done. Right. What kind of set is that? It's a failure. Now, see, you're, you're a bit incredulous because you still have operative in your subconscious the almost childlike, overly simplistic notion that more is better. Wipe, wipe away, pretend for a few minutes that you never read muscle magazines, that you never had the idea that more is better, which again is an aerobic training principle. Take a new, a fresh, new, unobstructed look at this thing. The human being, again, has, is a specific entity with specific characteristics and specific requirements. One of his specific characteristics is that he has a strictly, specifically limited recovery ability or adaptive capacity. You don't want to use up any more of that than is minimally required to compensate for the merely exhaustive effects of the workout. You following me here? Exactly. The first thing the body does after a workout is not grow, but what? Recover. Right. Which means, which is what I mean when I say compensate for the merely exhaustive effects of the workout. When you're done working out, dear listener, you don't feel the same way you did before the workout. You feel exhausted. Something was used up. The first thing the body will do after the workout is devote its energy and resources to putting back that which was used up. Compensate, in other words, for the exhaustive effects of the workout. That takes time and energy and resources. To the extent that you overtrain, more of that limited recovery ability is used to compensate for the merely exhaustive effects of the workout, leaving that much less left over for the production of growth, which takes place only secondarily. Hmm. Is that clear? Yeah. So why is it that... See what I'm getting at when I... Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it makes perfect sense. And I think the, the point that you, you made that people are really going to have to grab a hold of is, is just forget everything you learned. Right. If you're going to adopt... Remember, muscle magazines are not sacred scripture. They're right. not even science journals. But even if they were, you have to read critically. Okay, the so... The idea that more is better only applies to money and pretty girls. <laughs> And it does have a certain limited application to endurance training. And I, I emphasize limited application. Even with aerobics, you've got to be careful not to overtrain. But if your goal is to improve upon your endurance, which means your capacity for performing large volumes of work, then yes, I can see where you would want to use the more is better principle. If more were really better with bodybuilding, now listen to me here, this is a good one. If more was really better, Lock on to those words. Grasp what I'm saying here. Look at the implicit logic. If more was really better, then for every hour that you trained, the results would get better and better and better. So why not train all day long? Nobody does that. It's not because of the time factor either. There are bodybuilders who would be willing to train literally all day long. I would have 20 years ago if I thought it would have gotten me somewhere. What, they, they recognize that there's a limiting factor. And again, it's not time. They have a vague sense that the body has a limited adaptive capacity or recovery ability. But they don't understand the idea of specificity. Again, man is a specific entity with specific characteristics and specific requirements. One of his specific characteristics that's relevant here, he has a strictly limited adaptive capacity or recovery ability. You don't want to use up even one scintilla more than is minimally required to compensate for the merely exhaustive effects of the workout so that you have that much left over to provide for the production of growth. Hmm. So, Remember, you don't grow during the workout. Yeah, absolutely. The workout merely serves as a trigger. Now, I was talking to David Durth a couple months ago, and he said that he and Aaron Baker had been trying this thing 
I had yeah. trained both of them. Right, and they said that they were loving it. It was. They made the best progress of their life by far. Right, David but Dirk was ecstatic when he was training. He but uh, stronger and bigger, literally every workout. Which brings up an interesting point too. Most bodybuilders, those using what I now refer to as the blind, non-theoretical volume approach, using the idea more is better, have very diminished expectations, Bill. They have come to accept the notion that progress is something to be witnessed unpredictably in tiny dribbles every now and then, and mostly then. I know because I had the same idea myself 20 years ago prior to meeting Arthur Jones. I was training three hours a day and making almost no progress, but I thought that's the way it was supposed to be. That's not true. And this is one of, one more very important thing I want to get across, one of those very crucial and important items, along with the idea of overtraining, is this notion about progress. Progress should not be witnessed unpredictably in tiny dribbles every eight months or so. You should literally see progress every single set of every single exercise, every single workout. Hmm. We're not in the dark ages, people. This is supposed to be an age of enlightenment. We've had philosophy and science. What's the purpose of a scientific theory? How can you ever come to critically analyze these different training theories unless you know what the definition of a theory is, which I'll give you right now. A theory is a set of non-contradictory abstract ideas, or as philosophers like to call them, principles, which purports to be either a correct description of reality or a guideline for successful action. One of my favorite analogies here, Bill, is with NASA, the Space Administration. Why has NASA been so spectacularly successful in sending men to the moon and bringing them back safely each time? Not because they kind of sort of know what they're doing. They understand the requirements of space travel down to the smallest detail. They understand, in other words, the theory of space travel. They implement the principles properly. And as a result, they, they've succeeded with all of their man-moon missions. Mm -hmm. I tell my clients, view each one of your workouts as a scientific mission of sorts and fully expect to succeed with each one. There is a reason why muscles grow. The cause and effect relationship between intense exercise and muscular growth was established a long time ago. This knowledge is not sacrosanct. It's not something that just belongs to Mike Metzer and Arthur Jones. It's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Why is it so hidden, and why is it so because hard? we, in fact, are living in a dark age. Hmm. We really are. Most people know nothing about logic or how to use it, how to hmm. use their critical faculties to come to understand different theories, sort out truth from falsehood. Most people are intellectually dependent. They're brought up in a given household, they're born into a given family by chance, into a given region by chance, into a given nation by chance. Uncritically, unquestionably, blindly, they accept the religion their family brings them up in. They accept their parents or their locale's political beliefs, their intellectual dependence. They've never learned how to identify and evaluate the facts of reality. And this is seen in most bodybuilders. We are living in a militantly anti-rational culture where people are actively discouraged from thinking, passively accept, blindly, uncritically follow the group. Well, geez, if all those bodybuilders say it's true, how could they all be wrong? Mm -hmm. Let me remind you that for thousands of years, millions of people sincerely believed the earth was flat. That didn't mean it was true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just because the vast majority of bodybuilders still use the blind, non-theoretical volume approach doesn't mean it's true, or it's the best way to go. Hmm. Why are there examples of people who've succeeded using other approaches? It depends. I'm glad you brought that up. It depends upon how you define success. 
you're making the mistake there, Bill, of citing the final result as indubitable proof of the superiority of a certain training method. I get this all the time, of course, and I love this one because I can answer the skeptics' questions and I enjoy watching their faces when they finally come to accept the idea later on. Not because I want to be a big shot, because I like seeing people coming to recognize how great logic is in human life. You would have to go... The, the most typical example I get is with Arnold and Lee Haney. Mike Metzer, how can you be so damn certain? How can you say that there's only one right way to train and you know it? When we have Arnold and Lee Haney over here training two to four hours, six days a week. Again, the mistake there is inciting the final result as indubitable proof of the superiority of a training method. You would have to go back through Arnold's and Lee's training career and calculate the thousands of wasted hours, training hours, during which they made little or no progress. You would scratch your head and ask yourself the question, didn't they have anything better to do? You would seriously question whether or not their achievement could rightly be termed success at all. Mm -hmm. When in fact, it's true, most bodybuilders really don't have anything better to do. <laughs> A lot of them only feel comfortable in the gym. It's the one area in reality where very little is demanded intellectually. They feel at home. In other words, Bill, they've elevated a social need into a training method. <laughs> and I ain't joking. That's it's true. A bit of reflection, and you know it's true. It's true. How many bodybuilders are given to sound, rigorous, logical thought, meticulous reasoning? Absolutely none that I've come across except Dorian Yates, and he could do a hell of a lot better than, he, than he's been doing with it. Hmm. Nobody wants to think. I ain't saying I'm the greatest at it, but I've been, I've been working at it a little bit at least, as you can hear. Right, right. Huh. Well, so you're saying that uh, they could have achieved the same end result um, by the the other pathway, and... and, and uh... They would have developed, they would have reached achieve their ultimate development sooner. When I say ultimate, I mean the, the level they did achieve. They would have developed it, reached it sooner, or they would have gone further had they used the proper methodology. It's not true that all training theories have some merit or are of equal validity. Hmm. You have to take this into account, too, and a little reflection, I think you'll see I'm right. They also used a lot of steroids. Right. Bodybuilders who don't use steroids and train two to four hours, six days a week, very quickly give up in frustration. Right. They're not given an alternative. They think this is the only way to do it, and erroneously conclude in many cases that they have terrible genetics or that they're hard gainers or no gainers. Make no mistake, Bill and listeners, more bodybuilders fail to achieve their goals than succeed. The people propagating these ideas without realizing it are endangering the future of their own market. Without a doubt, more people give up than succeed. These people purveying nutritional supplements and muscle magazines are relying on the constant turnover, the new generation always coming in. Right. Right, like a lot of the... Uh the nutritional companies depend on the, you know, they get a one-time purchase, and uh, people figure it out, and they don't come back. Exactly. So, the uh, why don't they do more to protect? I mean, like the, well, I guess Weeder does allow you to to share your ideas pretty freely in the magazine. Well, he's been very good about that. Yeah. I'm not sure why exactly. I've got a few ideas, but I'd rather not go into that. <laughs> Let me. Uh, let me go into a little bit more about these sets. I'm, I mean, I'm curious because I'm going to work out in two hours. What is one of these sets like? Is it a, do you reduce the weight and keep going until you're just done? Or well, do you or do you just do one weight at, uh, and one set to total failure to where you literally... We do one set to positive failure and occasionally, randomly, add a forced rep and or a negative, but only randomly. Hmm. Now, if, if you're incredulous, if you're skeptical that one set could possibly be enough, Bill, 
it's still the logical place to start. Remember, I said a proper science of bodybuilding should tell you exactly what to do, exactly the right number of sets. Let's say we don't know. We could do an experiment to find out. We could launch our experiment with a, an arbitrary number of sets, like 20, and that is arbitrary. Where in the hell did they ever get 20 sets in the first place? They just grabbed it blindly out of the cultural atmosphere. More is better. But if 20 sets doesn't work, and this is the problem with that approach, if 20 sets doesn't work, where do you go? Up to 21 or down to 19? You've got to keep in mind this. We're looking only for that amount which is required, the precise or least amount required to stimulate the increase. Okay? Now you've got to keep that in mind to follow the logic. I said that it's only logical to start with one set. We're looking for the least amount necessary to begin with, right? Right. If one set doesn't work, you can't go any lower to find the least amount necessary. You can't do zero sets and have a workout. If one set doesn't work, Bill, then you've got a reason, a justification for going to two. If two doesn't work, then you've got a reason for going to three. If you're skeptical, dear listener, just think of it that way. You've got years ahead of you. Start out with one set per exercise. If it doesn't work, you can always go to two. Keep in mind, we're looking only for that amount of exercise which is required. Right. Minimum amount of exercise. This is, this is not an arbitrary approach. If you start out with 12 or 15 or 20, that's arbitrary. If it doesn't work, where do you go after that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not like I've got some weird emotional investment in the idea of one. I'm looking for what works. I don't care about the past, tradition, dogma. I know that most people don't think. I never accepted, well, I did a long time ago, accept it uncritically. <laughs> but my eyes were opened up by Arthur Jones when he said to me, most of what is published in all subjects is hogwash. And I studied that idea, and I saw that it was true in so very many areas. I saw that muscle magazines were not science journals. Right. So, I'm not denigrating muscle magazines here, by the way. I think they do serve a useful purpose. But you've got to learn to read critically. Oh, yeah, no, I agree 100%. What about, let's say that, uh, that I had the opportunity to work out with you. Have you trained me? I'm going to forget you know, my multi-set workouts. I go to the gym, I'm gonna hit upper body, or how do I break the groups down? Do I work arms one workout, or shoulders, or? I have my, my new clients start out on a Monday with chest and back. Okay. For their chest, they do one set of flat bench dumbbell flies, or pec deck, followed immediately in pre-exhaustion superset fashion by a set of close grip incline presses. A total of two sets. Mm -hmm. That's it. Very often after that super set, I'll have a new client ask me this question. Mike, why don't we do another set? My stock reply now, Bill, is this. If you can give me one good reason, not two, just one, why we should do another set, I'll consider it. Well, several years now, having trained over 400 people, not one single individual was able to give me one good reason why I should let them do another set. If I were then they would be justified in asking to do another one after that. <laughs> you see my point? Yeah, I see We're your point. We're looking for the precise amount required. So what do you think? Do uh, uh, you think those are the best exercises for, for the chest then? Yeah. And that's flat dumbbell flies? Flat bench dumbbell flies followed immediately by a set of close grip incline presses. By close grip, I mean closer than shoulder width. Contrary to popular belief, wide grip inclines and benches are not the best for pec development. Close grip is better. Hmm. What should be wide are the elbows. The elbows should be flared back away from the torso towards the ears. Okay, so that's one set. I jump from the fly, I go, what do I do? I go, come in and warm up with some light dumbbells first? Yeah, as far as warming up goes, it's... It's very difficult, if not impossible, to issue a surefire universal warming up prescription, one that fits everybody. Warming up needs vary according to the individual's age, existing physical condition, and even the temperature of the gym right. can affect warming up uh, requirements. But there is a general principle which will help answer that question. By the way, 
my approach to all this is in terms of principles. I don't expect anybody to accept what I have to say as an arbitrary, out-of-context injunction just because I say it. Mm -hmm. If you learn to think in principles, you'll learn to think logically. Principles make thinking a lot easier. The general principle is this. You perform any amount of warming up which you believe is minimally required so that you can proceed to the intense portion of the workout secure in the knowledge you will not injure yourself. Mm -hmm. I see many bodybuilders come into the gym, Bill. They do 20 minutes on the Stairmaster. Then they spend 10 to 15 minutes stretching and an equal amount of time doing a light to moderate barbell warming up. They've already set up an overtraining situation by the time they commence the hard part of the workout. Remember, it's very easy to overtrain. Don't turn your warm-up into a workout. Right. So what would be the minimum? I come in, maybe do some barbell bench presses, a couple of flies, and I'm ready to go. I can barely hear you on that one. Okay. What would I do? Let's see. I, I, I wanted to come in and warm up the upper body before this chest workout. If I did a couple sets of barbell bench presses or one set of barbell bench press with 100 pounds. I have found that usually one set of, of light to moderate bench presses, one set of light to moderate dumbbell flies is all you need. Okay, a couple sets, get warmed up, and then I'm ready to pick up the, some heavy dumbbells. And what type of rep range should I be working for? Uh, 6 to 20 or? Well, um, I would recommend that you select a weight for each exercise that allows for the performance of approximately 6 to 10 reps in reasonably strict fashion. Mm -hmm. As you grow stronger and find you're able to perform more than 10 reps, increase the weight by 10 to 20 percent or any amount that you believe necessary so that you're forced back to the performance of approximately 6 to 10 again. Now, if in a given workout, let's say you're doing barbell curls, and by the third rep, you clearly recognize that you're not going to get six to ten. You're only going to get four or five. Don't stop and reload so that you can get six to ten. Get four or five. Your next workout, you'll get six to ten. By the same token, in another workout, you're doing curls. And by the eighth rep, you clearly see that you're going to get 16 reps or so. Don't stop and reload. I don't want you doing even a half a set more than is required. The human being has a strictly limited recovery ability. Even a half a set more than is necessary can be a negative. Hmm. When you're training intensely enough to stimulate an increase and precisely regulating the volume and frequency, that is the number of sets and the number of workouts in a given unit of time so that you're not overtraining, you'll see progress literally on every set of every exercise every time you go into the gym. You'll go up either in reps, in weight, or both. Hmm. As I stated earlier, Bill, I have clients that go up on every set of every exercise, every workout for months and months and months. Wow. What type of gains in uh, you know, uh, muscle size can, can well, they experience? Actually, let me give you an outstanding example. Another young man came to me a couple years ago, in fact, from Switzerland. He didn't really come to me. He came to Gold's Gym as kind of a last-ditch effort to find something that might work. He had spent three and a half years prior to that training six days a week, two and a half hours a day. He made almost no meaningful progress. He was ready to give up. I told him a whole bunch of the stuff I've already related to your listeners. I told him, what you need is not just another variation of the more is better idea. This is what most bodybuilders do, by the way. One program doesn't work, and they think they're going to try something new, when in fact all these other theories are mere variants of the same thing. What this young man required, I told him, was a, a radical new approach, the right approach. Not more is better, but harder is better. And I told him, like I told your listeners, that the harder you train, the less time you can or should train. After about 45 minutes, I had convinced him to work out with me for at least a few months. As it turned out, he stayed with me for four months. At the end of the fourth month, we looked back over his progress chart. In that period of time, Bill, he performed a total of only 400 sets. 
but he made progress on every single one. Without exception, he went up in reps, in weight, or both on every set of every exercise, every workout each week for four months. In some areas, he doubled his strength, and with his legs, he tripled. And he gained 38 pounds. Jesus Christ. And it wasn't just a mixture of fat and muscle. His girlfriend told me that for the first time in her life, she was able to see his abs. Mm -hmm. So he, he obviously did not gain any fat. He gained more muscle in four months than he was able to gain in three and a half years. When you're doing this thing right, people, many of, many of you may erroneously believe that you're hard gainers, no gainers, that you have terrible genetics. Unless you're imposing upon your body the specific stimulus required in the proper amounts, you could literally have Mr. Olympia genetics and not achieve results. Now, these guys who have won Mr. Olympia with the other approach, you got to remember, they take tremendous amounts of steroids. Mm -hmm. What about the, the kid that you worked with from Switzerland? Is he, was he drug-free or was he dabbling first, in some the stuff? The first 25 pounds he gained, Bill, was without steroids. At that point, he got so excited by his uninterrupted progress, he said, Mike, imagine what I would do if I took steroids. I did not encourage him to do so, but he did, and he gained 13 more pounds. But interesting, mm -hmm. at the time he decided to take steroids, he was still gaining. It was not like he, he had a couple workouts or a week or two of, of no progress. He was still making uninterrupted progress. There was no reason to believe that his progress would have ceased naturally. Hmm. He may not have gone all the way up to a total of 38 pounds gain, but he was still gaining. Huh. Do you suggest that people cycle this training style, or is this just a, is that compensated for by just adding enough recovery? You don't have to cycle it. I get tired of hearing these people blindly attacking the theory of high-intensity training when they've not taken even three seconds to try to understand it. When you're allowing enough time between workouts for full recovery and growth, there can be no overtraining. The only people who need to cycle or periodize are these guys like the ones who advocate the Ironman system or Perillo or even Weider. By implication, their systems lead to overtraining. You would only need to periodize or cycle down because you're overtraining. Right. With the proper training program, you do not overtrain. See my point? Exactly. So the idea is not to go into the gym and just blindly see how much you can do or or do what amounts to engage in a series of random motions being moved by your by your blind urges. There is a proper scientific theoretical approach to this. The human body does have certain identifiable characteristics. We're not in the dark ages here. Hmm. So what about let's let's go over this workout of mine again. I'm sorry, I just uh, I'm real excited to learn exactly uh, what I would do from there. I'm going in the gym. I'm warming up. I'm hitting my set of flies, flat bench flies. Is that right. with the elbows fairly bent or pretty uh, wide or? Well, I hate to get too involved in this kind of detail, but right. on this one, yeah, uh, okay. bent arm flies. Okay, then I go to close grip bench press. Right. And that's superset fashion. Superset fashion, no rest. Uh, so I go hit my flies until I literally cannot lift it again. Not until I just feel kind of tired and it's uncomfortable and I want to set no. it down. Now, now that's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question, Bill. If you were able to curl 120 pounds for a maximum of 10 reps, mm -hmm. and no matter how hard you try, you could not do an 11th, okay? Right. The 10th rep is the last possible rep. Which rep of that set would be more productive? The first rep, the easiest, or the last rep, the hardest? The last rep. Now, what if you didn't do the last rep? Exactly. See my point? Mm-hmm. It's logical to assume that not only is the first rep not the most productive, neither is the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, or ninth. You know, there's a lot of skepticism out there about the theory of high-intensity training. If you were to ask any one of those skeptics, which rep of a set carried to failure, a set of 10 reps carried to failure, 
would be the most productive, the first or the last, every one of them would be forced to admit that the last rep would be the most productive. Nobody in their right mind, no one with a normal intact functioning brain would say the first rep of a set of 10 carried to failure would be the most productive. Don't you think it's logical to assume that the last rep would also be more productive than every preceding rep? Exactly. Well, then, if you don't do that last rep, then you see where you're, you're shortchanging yourself? So a lot of people may be caught in this trap of, I'm going to pick up a weight and count to eight and set it down. Right. They never get a productive rep in, no matter how long their workout is. They're, they're violating, they're flouting all three principles. They don't train intensely enough, number one. They do too many sets. Their workouts are not brief enough, number two. And they train way too often. They're doing aerobics. Right. Okay, so I think that one of the things that people listening to this tape need to realize is that they need to go to all-out physical maximum, I mean, to failure, to where you literally cannot pick that weight up again in any reasonable form. No, just go to positive failure where you can't do another full range rep. You don't have to allow the set to degenerate into a series of 16th reps. Okay. You just, you cease the set when you can no longer complete a full range positive rep. Okay. And then occasionally you'll do a negative rep. A forced rep and or a negative. Okay. When I first started training people several years ago, I had them all doing forced reps and negative negatives every set of every workout and almost nobody was gaining satisfactorily that's when i came to understand much more clearly just how demanding high intensity training really is that the body has a strictly limited recovery ability or adaptive capacity you've got to be very careful i used to use the analogy bill that high intensity heavy duty exercise is like going out into the intense august sun i've changed that it's more like going out into the intense August sun with the sun five million miles closer to the earth. Right. Or even more precise, it's like jumping into, the, into a fire. It's a very intense stress. It'll warm you up, but you gotta jump right back out. Right. Okay, so I get done with my set of flies. Now I wanna jump immediately or with a, a 10 second rest or? No rest. Uh, immediately I jump into close grip incline bench press. Right. And take that to failure. Failure. I'm done with chest. That's it. Now, ask yourself after the work, after that's over, if you're thinking about doing another set, give your give yourself a justification. If you can justify doing three, a total of three sets, doing one more set, then you can justify asking yourself that after the next set, and the next, and the next, and the next. Hmm. Even if you're skeptical that this little bit is enough, it's still the logical, the rational, the intelligent place to start. We're looking for the least amount necessary. Well, understanding now, after all that I've just said, that any more than that is overtraining. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, you could always add a set later on. But if you start out with 12 or 20 or 30 and that doesn't work, where do you go? <laughs> Knowing what you know now, you'll be prompted to say down. But how far down? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you unequivocally, listeners, with all of my training clients, including Dorian Yates, Aaron Baker, David Dirk, David Paul, one set per exercise is all that's needed. Hmm. It works every time. Get, get out of your thinking, get it out of your head that more is better. If more is better, then you should literally train all day. <laughs> but you recognize there's a limiting factor. The okay. limiting factor is the fact that the body has limited recovery ability. Right. You don't want to do any more exercise than is minimally required to stimulate the body to grow and get stronger. Okay, on my reps, are we talking slow up, slow down, explosive, positive, slow, yeah, never eccentric? Explosive. That's very dangerous. You want to lift the weight under full muscular control, pause momentarily in the contracted position and lower under control. Okay, just a nice nice rhythm. You want to eliminate thrust and momentum as outside forces involved in getting the weight started and keeping it moving. You want to move the weight through sheer force of muscular contraction alone. High intensity training, Bill, is really about high intensity muscular contraction. The harder that the muscle is made to work, the more severe the contraction, the greater the growth stimulation. Mm -hmm. This is what high intensity training is, is about technically. It's about understanding the nature of high-intensity muscular contractions. 
it sounds scientific because it is. This is what it's about. Hmm. Okay, so what about, I'm trying to get the, my days organized. I'm, I'm doing chest and back. What do I do for back now that I've done my chest set? Well, after you complete that chest superset, you can take a brief rest. Go get a drink of water, walk around the gym until your breathing returns to normal. Then you start your back workout with a set of close grip, palms up, like you're doing a barbell curl. Close grip, palms up, pull downs. Okay, kind of like a chin up. Yeah. Then you take a brief rest. This is not a super set. You take a brief rest and move on and perform a set of bent over barbell rows. Take another brief rest and perform a set of shrugs. I, I usually recommend that if the trainee has one of those universal type bench press machines available where you can stand in between the hand, handlebars. Mm -hmm. That's a lot more comfortable way of doing shrugs. If you don't have one of those, do dumbbell shrugs. If you don't have heavy enough dumbbells, do barbell shrugs. But that can be uncomfortable with the barbell rubbing up over your thighs and testicles. Right. So <clears throat> you, every set that you mentioned, I mean, just minimal warm-up and then go to absolute failure on a positive portion. Right. Then do we train biceps and triceps, or do we assume that the triceps and biceps got work during got, the back? got work that day. Okay. But they're going to be worked again in your next workout. So do I take a day off now, or do right. I come take back? Take a day off, and, well, it depends. I have 99% of my phone consultation clients, especially, start out with an every 72-hour program. They'll train on a Monday, as I just stated, with mm -hmm. the chest and back. Mm -hmm. They'll take Tuesday and Wednesday off and train Thursday. Maybe hit late? Saturday off and train Sunday. So I'd be hitting legs the next workout or something? Oh, no. yeah. Next workout would be legs. And what do I do on my days off? Just find something else to do with my time. Find a, find a good philosophy book by Ayn Rand. Learn how to think critically. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, it's interesting you bring that up and you, and you giggle. I know why you are, because I joke about it too. Bodybuilders do elevate a social need into a training method. They don't have any other values that they hold passionately enough. Right. To, they, they literally become anxiety-ridden when they're not in the gym. They don't know what else to do. You better believe it. So would it would they be able to do aerobic exercise on those days if they wanted no, I, to? No, I'm adamantly opposed to any aerobic exercise except right before a contest. Right. You remember, your body has a strictly limited adaptive capacity or energy. Right. You have 100 units of adaptive energy, period. Right. You divide it, Bill, between bodybuilding and aerobics, you get mixed results. Yeah, doc, yeah Dr. Connolly has, has said the same thing to me, that aerobics and ma weight training just don't mix well. No, if, if you divide your adaptive energy between the two, you get mixed results. It's not like you have 100 units of adaptive energy available for increases in strength and size and 100 units available for... Uh, improvements in endurance. You have 100 units available, period. If you divide it up between the two, do you not see you get mixed results or no results? Perfect. That yeah, makes perfect sense to me. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, this this whole thing, uh, we're, we're getting low on time and I, I want to uh, get some other information in, but this whole thing I think may, may completely re... Uh, shape the, the way some people think and, and approach this uh, weight training and certainly if you had it your way that's uh, uh, what you'd like them to do huh? well all I can do is offer to people my ideas the rest is, is up to their their own mental effort energy if you don't get some of these ideas on the first listening then listen to this tape again and or buy my books Right, well, I, I have a lot of people who think they're not smart enough. This is really not all that difficult, but it is unfamiliar material. That's all that is, listener. If you're smart enough to learn the ABCs, if you're smart enough to write a sentence, read a book, then you can master any kind of knowledge in this universe. It just takes mental energy, effort. Right. Hey, let me, um, I want to talk about your books, and I want to talk about this consultation that you mentioned a couple of times, right. because I guarantee you people are going to have specific questions that they think, you know, they would like to address with you one-on-one -on -one before they move on and take this big leap of faith. But well, I would, I would, I invite okay, good. anybody and everybody who has questions, even the skeptics, I love skeptics, I can answer any question you throw at me, 
Great. You hold reason and logic as a value. These we'll have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> these uh, these workouts. What do they take? Forty minutes? A half hour? So my my clients' workouts average twenty minutes. So you, you good thing you don't get paid by the hour, or do you? <laughs> I get paid by the workout. <laughs> good. Actually, they they should be paying me more because in addition to guaranteeing them progress, they're saving time, and time is money. Yeah, you're damn right. Okay, I'll tell you what, Mike. What books have you got out right now that you would recommend? Because a lot of people are just, just like me right now after this interview, I'm feeling very hungry for more information on this this right. entire uh, uh, philosophy. <laughs> I have three books available, Bill. I have the new revised Heavy Duty book. The original Heavy Duty book was first published in 1977 and is now a classic. Right. Rather than respond to the recent clamor for that book by re-releasing it, I decided to improve upon it. The new heavy-duty book goes much deeper into the science of bodybuilding, addressing such issues as why bodybuilders are confused, a rational approach to the subject, why Dorian Yates may be the first bodybuilder to actualize his full physical potential, a critical analysis of the traditional approach, the role of genetics, motivation, and much, much more. That's twenty-four ninety-five. Okay. That's... Uh, I have another book titled The Heavy Duty Journal. Um, this one, in some ways, is my favorite in that it explores a diversity of topics rarely before discussed as they pertain to bodybuilding. Topics include the stress concept, salt water and blood volume, the body dynamic, the value of a training journal, there's a chapter on advanced high intensity techniques, and much more. That's fourteen ninety five. Okay, and the title of that one is the Heavy Duty Journal. Okay, so I've got the Heavy Duty Journal, and that's fourteen ninety five. Fourteen ninety five. There's a Heavy Duty Nutrition book. In there, I explain how the individual can establish his nutritional maintenance requirements, and then how to figure out what he'll need beyond that amount, so that he can provide the nutrition required to build the muscle he wants without adding any fat. I also discussed the nutritional mistakes I made early in my training career, the role of supplements, and a rational approach to the subject of nutrition. That's eight ninety five. Okay, what about postage on any of these books? If I want to send away for them, uh, California residents add eight point two per eight eight point two five percent sales tax. Orders under twenty five dollars add three dollars postage and handling. Orders over twenty five dollars add six dollars shipping and handling. Overseas orders add another ten dollars beyond that. Okay, what about uh, where do I send an order if I want to get one of these books? To Mike Mentzer. Mm -hmm. Make sure you spell that last name right. It's M is in money, E N T Z is in zebra, E R. Mike Mentzer. Okay. P O Box two two one nine, Venice, V E N I C E, California, Venice, California, nine zero two nine four. Okay, and if, if somebody wants to, well, wait a minute. First of all, who would they make the check out to, Mike Mincer? Mike Mincer. Okay. What if I wanted to get a phone consultation? Should I write to that address and you'll send me information? No, I, I'd rather talk to the individual by phone. I am available for personalized supervision. Those interested in receiving my personal supervi supervision at Gold's Gym in Venice, California, or by phone can call me at area code 310 827 Seven six six one for rates and information. Okay. And I'm available seven days a week. Well, I'll tell you, Mike, uh, you're opening a lot of eyes, and I, I really appreciate the the, uh, the time you spent with us today. And I'm only going to, um, you know, send out this invitation that you help me share these ideas through future issues of Muscle Media 2000. That's something that maybe we can talk about later. But yeah, I'd like I guarantee you, a lot of people out there would uh, would love to hear more from you. And. Uh, I think that about's going to wrap it up. Or, pardon me. That's about going to wrap it up for our time. Well, and uh, hopefully we can we can talk again sometime. I appreciate that, Bill. I look forward to it, and I also look forward to once again hearing from all those listeners who have questions, want to learn more about the actual science of productive bodybuilding exercise. Terrific. Thanks, Mike.